Yeah, so I'm really privileged to be talking to you today. Um, I haven't spoken too much about this issue in public before, but I've written a few things about it and done a couple of talks on it. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to offer you something useful today. Uh, just to give kind of a brief introduction to me and who I am. You know, I grew up in Croydon, so not too far from here, just down uh, south of the river uh, in a quite, uh, some would say ghetto area, but obviously I don't sound like I'm really from the ghetto, so it's kind of a weird mix. Um, but yeah, I'm a local boy. Um, I then went to university to study medicine at Oxford, uh, which I'm still doing now. So after three years, I graduated with a degree in medical sciences, mainly neuroscience. Uh, and now I'm just in the final year of medicine. So I've got my exams in a few months. Uh, and hopefully I'll be going on to do psychiatry as a specialty later, later on. Uh, so in the first talk, we heard a little bit about the mental health aspects. I'm currently writing a paper researching the mental health aspects of abortion and the impact it has on women. And so I can endorse uh, everything that was said earlier, uh, and I can offer that if people want to read about the evidence that points either way. Uh, I should say, I don't know how long my career in clinical medicine will last, uh, and this is for two reasons. One is that I have a very strong interest in academic philosophy, uh, which I think is a positive thing. Uh, so I've done a little bit of work in ethics, publishing, and other parts of philosophy. And I've had a good opportunity to do lots of that in Oxford. Uh, the other reason is obviously because this is an incredibly politically incorrect position to hold. Um, so being pro-life in the NHS, it doesn't make you a very popular person. Uh, and I can imagine that it will present at least some obstacles in my career. Uh, but I'm looking forward to, to challenging them, uh, to taking them on and confronting them, uh, and doing what's right, because that's what's the most important thing in this field. Um, and then I just have a last line just to kind of prove that I am a human being. Um, just say that I, I'm not only interested in kind of academic things, I really enjoy sports and music uh, and just enjoying myself. I like to have an interest in people and do what other people enjoy doing. But today I'm going to be talking about philosophy. Um, so there's, there's obviously lots to do with medicine and that's one of my areas of interest. Uh, but today I'm talking about the philosophical aspects to do with abortion. And so I've done a little bit of work on this. And so I'm just going to briefly start by saying what is philosophy? Uh, and often it's seen as a kind of wishy-washy, vague thing. People don't really know what it means. Some people think philosophy is kind of just like poetry or just saying kind of profound or not so profound things that don't really seem to have obvious meaning, but they just sound nice or, or flowery. Um, actually, there's a, there's a strong tradition within philosophy, especially more recently, uh, that philosophy is really quite the opposite in that it's very rigorous, detailed, uh, analysis of the world. It's really thinking really, really hard about something. So Alvin Plantinga famously characterized it as it, philosophy is not far from just thinking really hard. So any topic, if you think about it hard enough, you will eventually get into philosophical debates, philosophical assumptions, and have to basically do philosophy. Um, and so philosophy includes things like logic, which is to do with reasoning, epistemology, which is to do with knowledge, how we gain knowledge, um, what knowledge means, metaphysics, which talks about what kind of things there are in the world, how do we explain what's in the world, um, ethics, which is to do with how we should act, and then there are a whole load of philosophy of blanks, uh, things like philosophy of religion, philosophy of science, pretty much any thing in the world will have its own field uh, in philosophy, so it's a really wide-ranging thing. And as I said, it underpins everything. So everything, if you think about it really hard enough, even the most mundane things like I'm standing here right now, that will bring up a whole host of interesting philosophical questions, you know, like how do I know that I'm here, what am I, what is a human person, um, how do I exist, what causes me to exist, uh, and so on. There are a whole load of important questions, and so that's why it's important to have at least a, a little grasp of philosophical aspects when talking about abortion. Yeah, and most obviously, abortion is an ethical question about how we should act. Um, it's often easy to see from a pro-life perspective how philosophy could you know, be seen as being a pro-choice thing. So most academic philosophers and most ethicists, uh, particularly in medical ethics and applied ethics, will be pro-choice. So when I'm doing my philosophy work, I'm also unpopular, probably even more unpopular than when I'm doing medicine uh, for being pro-life. And it is probably fair to say that most ethicists are pro-choice, uh, or at least sympathetic to it. Um, but I should note there are also some very important exceptions. So sometimes it's seen as, you know, all ethicists and everyone who's thought about this issue really hard uh, is pro-choice, whereas actually there are um, pretty profound and uh, 
uh, respectable exceptions, like Don Marquis, uh, who's not a Christian, uh, but he argued very persuasively uh, and famously that abortion is immoral. Francis Beckwith, uh, based in Texas, is a, a good political philosopher and ethicist. Richard Swinburne is one of the foremost philosophers of science in the world. He thinks that abortion's wrong. Jim Stone, also from America, again not a Christian, has also famously argued that abortion is wrong. Uh, and Alex Proust, who's one of the most um, respected up-and-coming philosophers and metaphysicians, has also written in detail about this topic. So there are very well-respected um, opponents of the pro-choice view, even within the academic literature. And pro-life work is making a comeback. So more recently, it's become acceptable to argue these positions. Uh, sorry. So recently, for example, I spoke at a conference in Portugal uh, on this topic, uh, expecting to be kind of harangued by the audience and um, seen as an outcast. Actually, they interacted very well, and I had one of the most famous pro-choice ethicists in the world interacting and uh, saying it was a, an impressive paper and that it was really something we should be engaging with. So this is really something that's encouraging, I think, to know that the pro-life work is making a comeback. Something also that's interesting, I think, about pro-choice academic literature uh, is that I think we can actually use it to our advantage. So although these people are usually arguing that abortion is permissible, um, and you know, this might seem unanimously and, unequi and unequivocally opposed to the pro-life position, there are actually important things in the pro-choice academic literature which support the pro-life case. Um, and this is because pro-choice philosophers, even though they're mistaken in many ways, uh, they will have thought very hard about the issue uh, in some cases. And this thinking about the issue um, allows them certain insights which I think are important and which I think support the pro-life case. So some examples. Um, Judith Jarvis Thompson, who's probably the most uh, famous uh, proponent of abortion rights uh, in the history of ethics, has, even though she defends the legal permissibility and moral permissibility of abortion, has said, I am inclined to agree, however, that the prospects for drawing a line in the development of the fetus look dim. I am inclined to think also that we shall probably have to agree that the fetus has already become a human person well before birth. And so contrast this with all the pro-choice people uh, and activists who say that the human person is just a part of the mother, it's a clump of cells, it's completely unimportant, has no rights at all. This is the most famous defender of abortion rights in the history of ethics, saying that we have to agree that the fetus has become a human person well before birth. Now, she doesn't think it becomes a human person at conception, but she nevertheless grants that the fetus in the late stage of pregnancy um, is very obviously a human person. Now, similarly, Jeff McMahon, who's also a famous uh, advocate of pro-choice rights, uh, he's talking here about the debate and how we should think about the debate in general. So there's lots of slogans and abuse um, in the abortion debate. Uh, and there's lots of things to do with women's rights. And he's saying that actually we should think about what the unborn thing is. Because if it really is a victim, then we have to be fair to that and we have to be sensitive to that and do the ostensible victim justice. And so he says it's no good just framing it as a question of women's rights and not thinking at all about the fetus. We have to say what the fetus is before uh, we make any case for the pro-choice position. So he says, although I defend the permissibility of abortion and thus welcome the introduction of the abortion pill, I do not believe the debate should end until we have the kind of intellectual and moral certainty about abortion that we have about slavery. It is important to notice that the ostensible victims of abortion, fetuses, are not parties to the debate, while of those who are involved in it, the only ones who have a significant personal interest or stake in the outcome are those who would benefit from the practice. He goes on, there is a danger that abortion could triumph in the political arena simply because it is favoured by self-interest and opposed only by ideals. We should therefore be wary of the possibility of abortion becoming an unreflective practice, like meat-eating, simply because it serves the interests of those who have the power to determine whether it is practised. The arguments in the public debate that focus narrowly and implausibly on choice reveal a tendency to try to convert abortion from a question of ethics into a question of interests. And I think this is really profound, actually, that he makes this point. And so even though he says at the beginning he supports abortion rights, and this is because he feels very confident that the unborn have no rights at all, he nevertheless says, until we have that kind of certainty, an enormous level of certainty that the unborn isn't a victim, that it has no rights, we should absolutely not 
respects the language of choice uh, when it comes to the question of abortion. We should absolutely think about what the unborn is uh, and whether it has any value or interests. Now, similarly, Boonin, who's another famous pro-choice uh, pro advocate, says, on the desk in my office, there are several pictures of my son, Eli. Uh, and he gives a few examples of the pictures, probably too many examples. Um, but he then says, in the top drawer of my desk, I keep another picture of Eli. The picture was taken September the 7th, 1993, 24 weeks before he was born. The sonogram image is murky, but it reveals clearly enough a small head tilted back slightly and an arm raised up and bent with the hand pointing toward the face and the thumb extended towards the mouth. There is no doubt in my mind that this picture too shows the same little boy at a very early stage in this physical development. And there is no question, he says, that the position I defend in this book entails that it would have been morally permissible to end his life at this point. And so again, he's not just endorsing the common slogans that the unborn you know, isn't the same kind of thing as us, is not a human being. Uh, he doesn't say that the unborn is just a clump of cells or a parasite or even that it's just part of the mother. He says very clearly that the unborn in this case, on the ultrasound image, was his son who would later grow up to be a child. Uh, who this it now is probably 21 or so. Um, he, Boonin says that really this is the same person and it's been the same person all along, even though he says that it would have been okay to kill that person uh, at that early stage. Uh, a final example, Singer, Tooley and McMahon, all of these three are very famous uh, pro-choice advocates. Uh, and quite famously, famously, they say that infanticide is permissible. So they think up until a certain stage after birth, post-birth abortion, we might call it. Um, these three people all think that there's nothing intrinsically wrong about that. That because the post-birth uh, post newborn is basically the same kind of um, thing as the fetus, they have the same rights. And that's basically no rights in both the cases. Um, I think this can actually work to our advantage. So even though it might seem um, a, a reprehensible view, nevertheless, these people have taken this view because they have recognized uh, the very clear truth that there is no moral difference between the newborn and the fetus. So these people go through the arguments uh, saying it's obvious that there's no moral difference between the fetus and the newborn. And therefore, because we think it's okay to kill the fetus, we also think it's okay to kill the newborn. Um, and actually, interestingly, one of my friends who's not a Christian was convinced by reading Peter Singer on this topic uh, that abortion was immoral. So even though Singer was arguing that abortion and infanticide are okay, my friend reading Singer realized that there was no difference between the newborn and the fetus, thought that it's obviously wrong to kill newborns, and so he became a pro-life advocate. Um, and so this is a really helpful example, I think, to note that these famous pro-choice advocates who have thought about the issue most uh, and more than any other, these people all recognize that there's no difference, morally speaking, between the newborn and the fetus. And that can be a very helpful point in debate. Um, just stepping away from philosophy for a moment, uh, I'd also just say that most clinicians, uh, when they're not talking about ideology, when they're not kind of wearing their pro-choice hats, if they're just talking as scientists and clinicians, they will agree that abortion is killing a human life. So recently I was invited to go and speak at uh, a school in Oxford, uh, a high school with the head of abortion services in Oxford, who's a consultant gynecologist who I know well. And so she oversees abortion for the whole of Oxfordshire. Um, and when we went into the school, she said, we have to just concede that this is taking life. This shouldn't be done lightly. This isn't a trivial decision. So for her, it ultimately boils down to women's rights. She thinks that the danger of backstreet abortions is so great that she nevertheless um, is kind of heads that service up and participates in them. But even she agrees that abortion is taking a human life, that it shouldn't be done lightly, and that we should really be thinking hard about these issues. And probably most gynecologists, when they're talking as gynecologists or obstetricians, uh, would agree that the unborn is a human life and that it's a distinct organism. Um, some might disagree when they've got their ideological hats on, but as scientists, this is the general feel of what people will be saying. Now to talk about the pro-life case, uh, and how we might argue for the pro-life case. Uh, it's important to note at the outset one of the most important things when making the case for the unborn. Uh, and th that important thing is this. The rights we are talking about uh, in the unborn are not just trivial rights. They're not just rights which 
you know, if we balance them up, they might be overweighed by some really trivial factor. Um, the rights that pro-lifers think that uh, the unborn have are extremely strong rights. They're extremely outweighing rights, um, and they can't be outweighed easily, um, especially not for the sorts of reasons that abortions are often performed. So just to link that with how adults work and how adult human rights work. When we talk about adult human rights to life and to not be killed in particular, uh, we normally agree that this right is a very strong one, that it can't just be outweighed very easily. So suppose I want some of your money and I say, well, if I kill you painlessly, I'm not causing too much harm to you uh, and I'd really like that money, it would make me a lot happier. It's obviously nevertheless still extremely immoral to kill that adult person. Um, and that's because my gaining money from his death isn't something that outweighs the cost of me having to kill that person. And the pro-lifer is committed to the view that the fetus and the unborn in general have those same kind of rights. These aren't rights that can just be outweighed by a failure of contraception or um, convenience or because it's a boy or a girl and we don't want to look after a boy or a girl. These are the kind of things that can't be outweighed by any factors, barring maybe a few special exceptions, which I won't talk about. But those would be things like in war or um, in cases of capital punishment and so on. Um, I'm, I'm happy to disagree about different things regarding those. But in general, we think that these rights are really strong, that the unborn have rights which can't be outweighed. Sorry, we, we believe that adults have rights that can't be outweighed by convenience or by failed contraception or by the fact that an adult is dependent on someone else. And the same is true of the unborn. And so when people try to talk about women's rights or to talk about freedom of choice or to talk about backstreet abortions, it's really important to focus on the issue, which is what is the fetus, what is the unborn, does it have a right? Does it have the right not to be killed? That's the most important issue, I think. Uh, and it's obviously also important to distinguish the moral and legal um, permissibility of abortion. So a lot of the time when I argue that abortion is immoral and that we should um, discourage it and try to prevent it, um, people will automatically assume that I'm talking about whether abortion should be illegal, even when I've not mentioned anything of the sort. Um, and actually, even though we might intuitively think that there's not much of a distinction between something that's immoral and something which should be illegal, uh, there actually is quite a significant distinction. Um, and it's actually significantly harder to make a case that abortion should be illegal. And so I think bear in mind at all times the conclusion you're actually arguing to. Feel free to argue that it should be illegal. I agree with that conclusion. But if you're only making the first step that abortion is immoral, then make sure that you focus on that point and that you don't get sidetracked into questions about the law um, because that can be quite an extra bit of effort and it can derail the issues. So I'm going to talk about five uh, reasons to think that abortion is immoral, five kind of pieces of evidence which suggest that, um, that fetuses and the unborn in general do have this kind of right to life, a really serious right to life that can't easily be outweighed. Uh, and these are all pieces of evidence for that conclusion. Uh, so the first is the evidence of human inclusiveness. We have good evidence from other spheres and other parts of ethics that all human beings are valuable. Um, and also we, we have good evidence that fetuses are human beings. They're not just parts of their mother. Uh, and so that's the first argument I'll talk about. The second is the argument from infanticide. And this is the argument that because there's no di moral distinction between the unborn and newborns, um, and since it's obviously wrong to kill newborns, we should also believe that it's wrong to kill the unborn. Uh, and that's already been alluded to uh, in previous talks. Um, the third piece of evidence I will talk about is secular failings. Uh, and this might seem a bit abstract, but it's basically the idea that alternative accounts, accounts that are sympathetic to the pro-choice perspective of things like value, of things like rights, of things like why killing is wrong, all these alternative accounts to the pro-life account uh, have serious failings, and I think that's also a piece of evidence in favor of the pro-life account. The fourth is a prudential argument, which is basically to say that if we're in doubt about whether something has rights, if there's kind of a reasonable chance either way, then we should err on the side of caution, and we should not kill that thing. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And fifth is just a, a brief note about religious arguments. Um, obviously, these won't work unless the person you're talking to is religious. Um, but nevertheless, they can be helpful when talking to religious people. And also, you can mention that 
if a non-religious person is advocating for abortion, they are in some sense begging the question. They're reasoning in a circle um, by assuming that religion is wrong and therefore abortion is okay because we don't have the religious backing for it. If religion, or at least if some types of religion, say that abortion is immoral, and if we have good evidence for those, those religions, um, then actually the abortion advocate will have to first show that those religions are false and then make an extra case that on a non-religious ground abortion is still acceptable. Um, I'll, ex I'll try and explain that a little bit better later on. So the first argument uh, I mentioned is to do with human inclusiveness and we can put it into a kind of a simple um, one, two, three step argument. Uh, and the first premise is this, the first kind of backing of our argument is all human beings have a serious right to life. The second premise is our fetuses, or substitute the unborn in general, are human beings. Uh, and it follows just from logical principles that therefore fetuses and the unborn have a serious right to life. Now we need to think about why these premises are plausibly true, why we should believe these premises to begin with. Now on the first one, uh, I think there's very strong evidence that all human beings have a right to life. Um, and I think one of the strongest pieces of evidence for this is that when we normally think about human rights, we think that they don't depend on things like economic stability or um, financial independence. They don't depend on physical deformity or disability. They don't depend on age or development or anything like that. Human rights, when we think about them, um, and when we think about the greatest moral movements in history, everyone has said that everyone has human rights, regardless of their color, regardless of their age or their gender, regardless of how developed they are, whether they're a child or an adult, regardless of how dependent they are, whether they're on lots of benefits or receiving charity or whether they're self-sufficient economically. No matter what stage or kind of um, attitude or position someone is in with respect to these things, we always nevertheless think it's wrong to kill them. And this is because human rights don't vary. They don't become gradable. We can't have someone with only a few human rights or a bit of human rights. Um, and we can't have someone with more human rights than others. Everyone has the same human rights. Uh, and I think this is quite a, a staggering um, realization that we've had to find that actually human rights don't vary. They don't go up or down depending on these kind of factors. Um, human rights are constant. Uh, and something has to account for that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But the greatest moral movements in history have all been based on the fact that human rights extend equally to everyone. So, for example, uh, the abolition of the slave trade, um, the, the getting rid of apartheid, uh, the stopping of the Holocaust, all these things were based on the idea that everyone was entitled equally to the same human rights. And so I think there's very strong evidence for the first premise here. And the second uh, premise like I say, it's obvious to most scientists when they're not talking about ideology, it's just that fetuses are human beings. Um, in particular, fetuses are the same human beings as the person who grew up, so from that fetus. So I talked about Boonin earlier, he says the ultrasound picture of his son Eli is obviously the same person, uh, the same human being as Eli, his son, who is now 21 years old. Um, most people can see this, and most people would say that fetuses are human beings, and so I think there's very good evidence for it scientifically. Um, and so it follows from these that fetuses have a serious right to life, just like all other human beings, regardless of age, race, gender, and so on. The second argument is the argument from infanticide. Uh, I think there'll already be a little bit spoken about this, both before my talk and later on, and so I won't talk about it in great detail. But just to run through it very quickly, the first premise is if infanticide is wrong, if killing newborns is wrong, then feticide is wrong as well. Um, the second premise, infanticide is wrong. Uh, and it follows from these premises that therefore fetus, uh, feticide is also wrong. So just supporting the first premises, uh, we'll note what Singer, Tooley, McMahon, and most pro-choice advocates who have thought about this issue already concede. There's no morally relevant distinction between the newborn baby and the unborn. And I think that's a fairly, fairly obvious um, premise when you think about it. The second premise has recently become controversial, and so I note those people, Singer, Tooley, McMahon, uh, all say that infanticide actually is okay, or the, the only reason it's wrong is because it will upset the mother, and so on. Um, so this premise has recently become controversial, 
But nevertheless, I think most people would still accept it. Most people would still be horrified and think it obviously immoral to kill newborns. Um, and it's interesting to note how people's reactions to this question of whether newborns have rights changes depending on the crime committed. So even though you might get a few kind of stray fringe pro-choice advocates who will say that actually killing newborns is okay, but you know, we shouldn't do it painfully as long as we do it um, sensitively and so on, it's okay. Um, nevertheless, most of those pro-choice advocates who are in the minority will say that raping a newborn uh, is, most of, yeah, most of those pro-choice advocates will say that raping a newborn is obviously morally abhorrent. And I think that's correct. So it's, it's very easy to see how these intuitive differences or these differences in attitudes towards newborns are changed when you change the crime. So even though, because maybe a few of us have been desensitized to murder, we might not think it's the worst thing. But when we talk about really serious crimes um, and things that still evoke an emotional reaction in many people, uh, like rape, we can easily see that most people would be opposed to raping newborns, even though if these philosophers are right, there should be nothing morally problematic about raping newborns because they don't have persons with rights or with bodily autonomy. And so I think there's very good evidence um, to think that infanticide or raping newborns, anything that um, denigrates the rights of newborns is wrong. And so I think that's very good reason to think that newborns have the same rights as the rest of us. And it follows from that that the unborn have the same rights as the rest of us. Secular failings. I talked about how alternative accounts to the pro-life account, um, these usually fail to adequately account for our intuitions about various other subjects. Um, in particular, there are three things which they, these accounts fail to account for. Um, one of these things is personal identity, which I'll speak a little bit about later. But generally, there's no consensus in philosophy that there's a good account of what makes me the same person as this body tomorrow. Um, that, that gets a little bit technical, and so I'll explain it more later, but I'll just note it for the moment. The second thing these alternative accounts fail to account for is the grounding of rights. Um, and so they usually say that rights are based on desires, um, or they're based on conscious experience, or something like that. But actually, when you think about those groundings of rights, they don't really make any sense of our moral intuitions. So take the desire account. We normally think that it's wrong to kill someone even if they have no desire to live. So someone who's temporarily depressed or suicidal as a teenager, for example, or someone who's just sleeping or comatose, we normally think that it's obviously wrong to kill them even though they have no desire to live. Um, but nevertheless, if, all, if the only thing that gives rights are desires, then this makes no sense. Um, because we obviously know that these people nevertheless have the right to live, even though they don't have the desire to live at that particular moment. Now you can modify that a little bit and say, well actually we're talking about future desires. So even though this person at the moment doesn't have the desire to live, nevertheless in the future they'll have the desire to live, and if you kill them you'll be frustrating that desire. But exactly the same thing could be said of the unborn. Even though the unborn doesn't currently have a desire to live, Nevertheless, in the future, if it's not killed, it will have the desire to live. And so killing it frustrates that desire. And so some of these accounts, when they're modified to become more plausible and to make better sense of our intuition, they actually become reasons to be pro-life and to think that the unborn have those rights as well. Um, there's, a, there's more that could be said about that, but I'll leave it for the moment. Um, finally, there's a failure to account for the wrongness of killing. Uh, this is very similar to the, the second point. Um, and so I'll leave it there, but we can see again, taking the desire account as an example, um, you might say killing is only wrong because it frustrates a desire to live. Um, and we've seen where that argument goes. It actually, when it becomes plausible, turns into an argument for being pro-life. Uh, my fourth argument, the prudential argument, this is the one basically saying, if in doubt, don't kill, err on the side of caution. Um, again, we can put it into a, a brief little argument. Um, the first premise, if there is a reasonable chance that something or fetuses have a serious right to life, it is wrong to kill them. Uh, the second part just affirms the first part of that first premise, and it just says there is a reasonable chance that fetuses have a serious right to life, and it follows again that therefore it is wrong to kill fetuses. Um, just to use an analogy here to illustrate this, suppose I was about to detonate a building uh, and I wasn't sure if there were people inside, but I'd hired a safety officer to find out whether there were people inside. 
Now, suppose I call my safety officer and say to him, hey, um, so when you went and did all the checks and made sure everyone was out, you know, how, how thorough were you? Are you sure that there's no one inside the building before I detonate it? Uh, and suppose the safety officer says, well, actually, I'm not very sure. I don't think so, but I didn't check very thoroughly. There's maybe kind of a 25% chance that there's someone in there. It would obviously be wrong for me to just proceed in a blasé attitude to just continue anyway uh, and just assume that it was okay that there was no one in there. Um, and that's because this is such a serious right that people have. Killing someone is such a grave um, deprivation of that right that we should be really, really confident that something doesn't have a right to life or that there's nothing to be killed um, before we go ahead and kill or, or do an action which will lead to death. And I think this is linked to the quote I gave earlier from Jeff McMahon, who's one of the foremost pro-choice advocates. He says, until we have the kind of intellectual and moral certainty about abortion as we do about the slave trade, we shouldn't be doing it, basically. And I think this is a good reason to suppose, um, suppose that that's correct. Um, and so I've already given arguments to think that there's a very high chance that the fetus has a right to life. But even if that chance was a lot lower, even if there was only a 25 or a 1% chance, um, nevertheless, I think we should still take great caution in abortion, and I think that's nevertheless a reason um, to speak out against it. Uh, the final argument, which I'll just tackle very briefly, is to do with religion. Um, I said before that if pro-choice advocates are just ignoring religion, then they're giving circular reasoning. They're assuming that religion is false and has nothing to say about this, um, and then you know, giving their pro-choice arguments and so on. But if that strategy is going to work, and if religion, or at least if a plausible religion, um, does say that abortion is wrong, then actually the pro-choice advocate can't just stick to their um, ethical arguments. They'll also have to show that the religion is wrong and that the religion can't teach us about anything. Um, like I say, not everyone is religious, uh, but for those who are, it's especially helpful to note these points. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said about this. I've got another presentation on Christianity and abortion, but just to mention very briefly um, a few points. So in Judaism, in the Hebrew Bible, there's a pattern about humans being spoken about prior to birth. And so many of the prophets were called by God before birth. Um, people cursed the day they were conceived. People like Job cursed the day they were conceived. Uh, and David talks about his life before he was born. Uh, and there's, there's a strong pattern in the Hebrew Bible that this kind of thing goes on. Um, moving to Christianity, there's a lot more that happens in the early church to do with this subject. So Christianity, until the mid-20th century, was actually the most consistently uh, pro-life religion around. So even though Judaism varied quite a lot and they allowed abortion in quite a few cases, um, and Islam has historically been relatively opposed to abortion compared to the secular world, uh, but nevertheless still um, very much pro-choice when it comes to the early stages of being unborn. Christianity has been the most consistently pro-life religion uh, historically. Uh, and interestingly, even though we often think that Christianity must be divided on the issue, it can't really say anything about the issue because Christians today disagree. Um, I think if you actually look at the history of the abortion debate and how it's been discussed within churches, the position that abortion is morally permissible is an incredibly recent one within Christianity. There's not even a hint of debate about it um, until very recently. And until the mid 20th century, churches were unanimously opposed to abortion. And I think this is, um, this is a very interesting point, and it's a point that's often neglected because we see the diversity within Christianity today. Uh, but actually, it had just the same kind of unanimity um, as things like the Trinity or the Incarnation and so on. Christians had always been united on this point uh, and very vocal about it since a very early age. Um, this can be backed up, obviously, by reference to the Bible and things that Jesus taught. So within the Bible, there's an emphasis on human inclusiveness regardless of um, economic wealth, um, age, and so on. Um, and so it's easy to see how that fits into a Christian picture. Uh, and then just briefly to mention some early church writings. So even though the New Testament doesn't explicitly mention abortion and the unborn, well, it mentions the unborn, but it doesn't mention abortion, um, the Didache, which is a late first century, maybe early second century. Uh, but this is kind of the same age as some of the books in the New Testament. Uh, this very explicitly teaches, you shall not kill a child 
uh, by abortion nor kill it after it is born. Um, and it's very interesting as well to note that the early Christians realized there was no moral difference between infanticide and between killing the unborn. Um, so the Didache, like I said, makes no real distinction between killing infants and killing the unborn. Uh, and this is actually the reason why infanticide, which was prevalent and common in Greek culture and in Roman culture, uh, was eventually outlawed. It was because Christians opposed both killing newborns and killing the unborn for the same reasons. And actually the reason we don't have infanticide today is because Christians had that pro-life attitude and they changed the Greco-Roman culture of the time. So I'm now going to just discuss a few philosophical controversies. So I've given the pro-life case, but I haven't really given a huge indication of where people disagree or about the relevant philosophical aspects, which we need to think about in quite some detail uh, to really make the robust case for being pro-life that we might want to. And so I've picked out three things which are controversial in the philosophical literature and which I think are important to the abortion debate. Um, I should say that there are some fairly technical details in this, and I don't expect everyone to understand it all or grasp it, and some of it's not overwhelmingly important, and certainly to engage in pro-life activism um, on a kind of the most ordinary and common level, we don't necessarily need to have the best grasp of these, and so certainly I don't have the best grasp of these uh, as some other people in the world, but nevertheless I feel confident talking about uh, my pro-life position and doing activism about it. Uh, but nevertheless, it could be useful to think about these things uh, and to have at least some grasp of them. So the first is the issue of personal identity. Uh, and here's where a lot of common, slightly more advanced, if you find a more sophisticated or um, technical pro-choice advocate, these are the things they might be saying. And so it's helpful to at least be familiar with the kind of arguments they might be making. And the ideas of a human having potential or there being a potential human and the ideas of personal identity actually come up quite a lot when talking about more sophisticated um, pro-choice advocates. So a brief note at the start to do with potentiality. Um, it's usually argued that pro-lifers rely far too heavily on the idea of potential. Um, so people say, oh, you know, an acorn is a potential oak tree. That doesn't mean they're the same or that they're equally valuable. Um, you know, there are loads of things which have the potential. A sperm cell or an egg cell has the potential to become a human, but that doesn't mean it's wrong to kill it or waste it. Um, so just because the unborn is a potential human, yeah, that doesn't mean it has any rights. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, this issue of potentiality. First, I'd note that you don't actually have to talk about potentiality to make a pro-life case. So up until now, I haven't mentioned the word potential. I've never once talked about the unborn child having potential to have value or having the potential to have life. I've talked about the unborn having rights and being a human being. The unborn doesn't just have the potential to do it. It is a human being and it does have rights. And so actually we don't need to rely on this idea of a potential person or a potential human in order to make a, a good pro-life case. Um, but I think it's also important to note that most arguments against killing in general, so most people think that some killing is wrong, killing innocent um, just innocent adults in general is wrong according to most people and this will require something to do with potentiality um, so they will normally say that the reason it's wrong to kill is because that human has the potential to have a flourishing life after them uh, and that's why it's wrong to kill them and similarly of course we know that the unborn has the potential to have a flourishing life after them and so it can easily be said that it's wrong to kill them as well so Potentiality, even though we don't necessarily need to rely on it for the pro-life case, can nevertheless be helpful in understanding what's wrong about killing and in understanding where your opponent is coming from, why they think killing is wrong. If you ask them why they think killing is wrong and they say because someone has the potential to have a good life, then we can say the same thing about the unborn. And that's helpful to bear in mind. But here are some challenges. So some people say, well, you know, the difference between an embryo and an adult is kind of similar to the difference between a sperm cell and an adult, or between an acorn and an oak tree. But obviously we value oak trees a lot more than acorns. We think that they're a lot more valuable. Uh, and obviously we value adults a lot more than we value sperm cells. So while we normally think it's okay to just let sperm uh, go unfertilizing, um, we don't normally think it's okay um, to kill adults. And so there's a difference there. 
And so some people say that that difference is similar to the difference between an embryo and an adult. Uh, but I'm going to explain why that's mistaken for a couple of reasons. So I think it's important here to note three different kinds of potential here. Um, three different kinds of difference between something in its early stages and its late stages. So the first kind of potential or kind of difference is the difference between a sperm cell and an adult cell. And the difference here is that there's, the sperm cell has the potential to give rise to a different substance with different rights. So this is something where the sperm doesn't, while, make, while still being a sperm cell, it doesn't become an adult. The sperm cell disappears and f causes uh, a fertilized egg to exist. And that fertilized egg and the embryo that develops from it then has rights. Yeah, and so that's one kind of potential. The second kind of potential is for something which remains the same thing, uh, but it somehow gains rights even though it remains the same thing. So the sperm cell doesn't remain the same thing. It ceases to exist and then it causes, at the same time, something different to exist uh, later on. The, oak, the acorn still carries on existing. It doesn't stay as an acorn, but it's still the same oak organism. Um, so we can't use the same kind of analogy as with the sperm cell. The acorn doesn't cease to exist, or at least the, the small, young oak organism doesn't cease to exist. But nevertheless, it gains rights over time. And so that's a slightly different case. Um, the third case is something which already has rights has the potential to continue to exercise them. Uh, and this is what we have in the case of adults. So adults already have rights to life or rights not to be killed. Um, and the reason killing them is wrong is because it frustrates that potential to carry on doing that. And I'm going to argue that the fetus falls into this latter category of potential rather than the previous two, and that it's more analogous to an adult rather than to a sperm cell or an acorn. So why are fetuses different from sperm and acorns? Well, we'll take the acorn case first. So this is where something, a very young, um, small oak organism grows, and as it grows, it develops value uh, over time. But the difference between acorns and embryos uh, is obviously that oaks don't have intrinsic value. They don't have rights or anything like human rights. The value of an oak tree is related to how beautiful it is, how useful it is. Uh, we don't think that trees just on their own have this kind of value or these kind of rights. They're only valuable insofar as humans or God or something else values them and because of these factors. And their value is gradable dependent on these factors. But humans don't work the same way. We don't think that less developed or uglier humans or ones which are less useful have any less of a right. Humans are just fundamentally different. Their value doesn't depend on these kind of parameters, whereas oak organisms do have value depending on these kind of things. And so that's a reason to think that the unborn child, which is a human, uh, is more similar to a human than an acorn. Um, sperm are not identical to adults, whereas fetuses are. And this is the reason I think that killing sperm is okay, but killing embryos is not. Um, and so the difference here is that fetuses are already individual human beings which grow into adults rather than, causing adult, rather than ceasing to exist and causing an adult to exist. Um, fetuses just are the same person that grows into an adult version. Um, and that's not the same with sperm. So sperm doesn't grow into a human. Sperm ceases to exist when it fertilizes an egg, and then the, egg, uh, the fertilized egg, the zygote, the embryo, is the human being that develops. And some people will say, well, why do you think this? You know, aren't you just kind of arbitrarily differentiating a sperm and a zygote? Why think that one is a human being and one isn't? Um, and here, we have to just get a little bit technical. Uh, I won't dwell on it too much, uh, but it requires something which is called the transitivity of identity. And this is basically the idea that when we talk about two things being identical, we talk about them being the same thing. And identity as a relation between two things has certain characteristics. Uh, and one of them is called transitivity. And what it means is this, that if A is equal to B, and that if B is equal to C, then A is equal, also equal to C. Um, and to, to give just kind of a brief example, if I am the same, if I am identical to... Um, Callum one day older, so Callum tomorrow. If I'm identical to him, and if Callum one day older is identical to Callum two days older, then I am also identical to Callum two days older. That's basically what it means, and it's, it's a very well um, 
kind of understood and accepted principle in the theory of identity and in logic in general. Um, but let's see how this principle works out if we apply it to sperm, eggs, and fetuses. Um, suppose the principle is true, and also assume that sperm and eggs are identical to fetuses. So suppose that the sperm is identical to the adult it grows into, um, just to, obviously we don't believe that, but we're trying to show it's wrong. And so for the moment, assume it and see what results. This would mean that the sperm is equal to the fetus, which we've granted as an assumption, and it also means that the fetus is identical to an egg. Uh, because that's also what we've assumed. But by the transitivity of identity, that also means that the sperm is equal to the egg. But we know that's not true. Everyone thinks it's silly to think that a sperm is identical to an egg. Um, a sperm could always uh, fertilize a different egg, uh, or it could never fertilize that egg at all. And it's obviously ridiculous to think that a sperm is identical to an egg. Um, especially when they've been separate for so long, when they might never come into contact, and so on. Um, and so what we have here is a silly result that is generated by the assumption we made, which is that sperm and eggs are identical to fetuses. So the way to get rid of that silly, ludicrous result is to reject the assumption in the first place, to say that actually sperm and eggs aren't identical to fetuses. And that's a fairly technical way, uh, but it's also, I think, pretty um, indubitable and convincing, and there's not really much room to argue against it. Um, and so if we can wrap our heads around that, that's actually a fairly decisive argument against the view that sperm should be given the same rights as zygotes. Um, and so I think that's a good reason to say that sperm don't have those same rights, whereas the unborn child does have the same rights as an adult. One other um, argument that's given is to do with twinning. And this is also related to personal identity. So many people think that twinning is a reason to believe that the early embryo cannot be identical to the adult it seems to grow into. Um, and the idea here is that if we have an embryo and then it splits into two, um, it's, you know, it's obviously ridiculous to say that one of these two twins, who are, seem to be physically identical, uh, or physically similar in so many ways, it's ridiculous to say that just one of these is the original embryo and that one of them was new. Um, but actually, when we think about it, two people arise from one original person all the time. So when people have a child, when a mother has a baby, uh, no, matter what part, no matter at what point you say that the baby suddenly becomes an individual person, at some point, that baby will become an individual person. And that's a, a very close to home, obvious example of how we can have one original person which then has another person that comes from it and results from it. And I don't see any reason why we shouldn't think the same is true of twinning, uh, why there can't be one original embryo and then one of them buds off and becomes a new person. So that doesn't seem to me to give any reason to think that the early embryo before twinning isn't also a human being, isn't an individual. Um, to mention a little bit about accounts of personal identity. Um, this can be useful just to know a little bit about what philosophers think about personal identity. So the problem that philosophers generally have is this. How do we know or what constitutes me being the same person as me tomorrow? So this is me today and this is me tomorrow. What relationship is there between the two that means that we are identical, that we are the same person? And there are different accounts of this. Uh, one is a nihilistic account, which is to say that actually personal identity doesn't exist. So even though I look the same, uh, and I have the similar thoughts, and I'm similar in many ways from me yesterday, or me today, tomorrow, even though they're very similar, there's not actually a relationship of identity. Um, maybe this is true, but if that's the case, then it's hard to account for any morality at all. Uh, if people don't persist through time, if I'm a completely different person today as I will be tomorrow, then it's hard to see why you should fulfill any obligations or promises you have towards me. It's hard to see why you should fulfill any desires I have, because by the time you fulfill them, I'll be a different person and you won't be giving anything good to me at all. It's very difficult to account for these kind of moral scenarios if that account of personal identity is true. There's another account which is dualistic, uh, which basically says that there's not only kind of the physical component of me, there's another component of me which accounts for my personal identity. And that other component of me just persists through time. So even though my physical characteristics change, even though I lose and gain atoms, even though I grow taller or shorter, 
Um, there's another part of me that stays constant, even though we can't see it. Um, and actually, that's what accounts for personal identity. Now, that might be true, and it escapes a lot of the problems of other accounts. Um, but if that account of personal identity is true, then it's sympathetic to the pro-life case. Uh, and most dualists probably are pro-life advocates. And so pro-choices can't escape by holding to this account of personal identity. Um, animalism, this is basically the view that I'm a human, animalist, a human animal. So the reason that me today is the same as me tomorrow is because I am the same animal as uh, today as I am tomorrow. Again, the pro-choice uh, pro advocate won't be helped by this because it's sympathetic to the pro-life case. Because if I'm the same animal as I will be tomorrow, I was also the same animal as the embryo which was in my mother's womb. And so it follows from animalism that the embryo which was in my mother's womb was the same person as me. And so again, it won't help the pro-choice advocate. Um, psychological continuity. This is probably one of the most common be ones because it's one of the few um, accounts of personal identity which allows for abortion to be morally acceptable. So I've said that dualism and animalism, for example, are sympathetic to the pro-life case. And anti-criterialism, which I won't talk about because uh, it gets too technical, um, is also sympathetic to the pro-life case. Um, so psychological continuity uh, is probably the only kind of mainstream position about personal identity which is sympathetic to the pro-choice case. Uh, and that basically says that this, the thing that makes me the same person today as I will be tomorrow is that I have some kind of psychological connection between the two. So I have memories tomorrow about today, or today I have beliefs which uh, are fulfilled tomorrow, or today I have desires and I fulfill those desires tomorrow. Those kind of psychological connections between the two might be what constitute personal identity. Um, but I think there's very good reason to think that this is a flawed account of personal identity. Um, and there are, there are some thought experiments you can think about to illustrate this. Again, this is quite technical, but it can be useful just to be very vaguely familiar with, or at least to know that these kind of arguments exist and that they can be met. Um, so the fishing case is basically... Um, there are, there are many kinds of similar cases. Some call them fission, division, replication, and they're all slightly different. Um, but one scenario is this. Today I exist, and then tomorrow, um, from my brain, people take apart my brain and then assemble two new people. And both these two new people, because they've looked at my brain and seen everything in it, these two new people have exactly the same memories, um, and they have exactly the same thoughts and beliefs and desires but both of them can't be me. I can't split into two people and still be the same person because then the two different people would be the same person. Again, like I say, it's technical, but if we think about the transitivity of identity, which I mentioned before, it can um, show that this is a pretty silly situation. Now, I won't dwell on it too much, but the idea is that we basically generate a silly result by thinking that the only thing which constitutes personal identity is me having psychological connections between um, me and the person I might be tomorrow. And so that doesn't explain why, um, it doesn't explain personal identity. Now, why is that important? It's important because a lot of people will say that you're only a person, you only persist from one day to another if you have these psychological connections. And because the unborn don't have psychological feelings at all, or at least they don't have sufficiently complex psychological connections, then the unborn can't be a person, and so it can't have rights. That's why it's important, because even though it's very technical, some of these more sophisticated pro-choice advocates will say that only persons can have rights, uh, and to be a person, you need to have these kind of psychological connections and experiences. And because the unborn doesn't have those, it can't be a person, and so it can't have rights. And so I think, even though it can be difficult and it can be very technical and academic, knowing that there is an answer to these kind of um, beliefs, showing that you can be a person and you can have rights without having those psychological um, events or continuity or connections, I think is important to a pro-life case, especially when we're dealing with the more technical opponents. So to move briefly on, I've only got two more slides. Um, the wrongness of killing. I don't think alternative pro-choice accounts of the wrongness of killing can account for it. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. So to, earlier I spoke about desires and whether 
killing as the frustration of some desires explains why killing is wrong. Uh, but there are some other examples of beliefs why people think killing is wrong. So some people think killing is wrong because it causes pain. Um, some killing doesn't cause pain at all, and so that doesn't really explain why killing is wrong. So people with leprosy, or very advanced leprosy, who can't feel pain, nevertheless have a right to life. And so that doesn't explain why killing is wrong. Um, maybe killing is wrong because it reduces pleasure. Um, because even though you might not cause anyone pain by killing them, you're preventing them from having pleasure in the future. But of course, the same thing could be said about abortion. You're preventing that unborn child from having pleasure in the future. And so that won't help the pro-choice advocate at all. Um, maybe killing is wrong because it frustrates actual contemporary desires. Maybe killing um, Daniel at the moment is wrong because he, has, he currently has the desire to live, and it frustrates that desire. But of course, sleeping or depressed or suicidal people, as I mentioned earlier, don't have those desires. But nevertheless, they still have a right to life. It's still wrong to kill them. And so that doesn't explain why killing is wrong either. Maybe we might talk about potential future desires. So even though Daniel might be very depressed and might not want to live now, tomorrow he might want to live. And that might explain why killing is wrong, because I'm going to frustrate that future desire. But of course, the unborn will also have a future desire to live if we don't kill it. And so that also doesn't explain how a pro-choice position can be tenable. Um, maybe killing is wrong because life is sacred. I'm inclined towards this view uh, and that there's a religious aspect to it. I think humans are um, valuable and they have rights not to be killed because God values them and God treasures them and loves them. But of course, the same could be said of embryos and fetuses. And again, this doesn't help the pro-choice advocate. Finally, um, is killing wrong because it deprives the victim of a future life of value? Some people have said this, the reason killing Daniel is wrong uh, is because you're depriving him of a future life which, whether, whether or not he has the desire to live in the future, is a future life of value. He can still enjoy things, he can still engage in relationships and so on. Um, but of course, abortion does the same thing. Uh, and this is the basis for one of the most famous secular, non-religious arguments in the academic literature against abortion. Uh, and this is Don Marquise's paper, which I'd highly recommend. Uh, and I'll give a reference to it uh, afterwards. Um, Don Marquis says that this is the reason killing is wrong, because it deprives the victim of a future life of value. But of course, Don Marquis realizes, even as a non-Christian, um, that abortion does exactly the same thing. It deprives the unborn child of a future life of value. And so all these accounts of why killing is wrong are either extremely implausible, they don't make any sense of our moral intuitions about why killing is wrong or about who it's okay to kill, Either that's the case, or they are sympathetic to, abort, uh, sympathetic to the pro-life position. And so I think that could be helpful in explaining um, why we think abortion is wrong. Very uh, briefly at the end, this is something I haven't spoken much about, but there's a huge amount of literature on it. Um, so to finish where I nearly started off with Judith Jarvis Thompson, who says, even if we grant that the fetus is a human being, it's still okay to kill it. And this is because no one has the right to exist or not to be killed at the expense of someone else's bodily autonomy. And so uh, Thompson uses an analogy with a violinist, and she says, well, suppose that I'm, I, I wake up one day and there's a famous violinist hooked up to me uh, with loads of wires going from their body into my body, and I'm basically necessary for her to live. Now, it would be very nice if I chose to let the violinist use my body in this way to continue to live, but I don't have an obligation to. And certainly, it should be legal for me to refuse to let the violinist use my body. Uh, and this is a very um, popular paper, uh, and it's the basis for a lot of pro-choice activism in the last few decades. I think it was published in 1971. Um, but there are so many problems with this paper that I think it's overwhelmingly implausible to use um, in, for the cause of pro-choice. Uh, so in the first place, Thompson concedes that the fetus is a human being. This is one of the main principles of the pro-life position, and Thompson just grants this. And so, you know, we're already halfway to, to winning the person over. Um, at most, it establishes legal permissibility. So even if we think it should be legally permissible for the violinist, for me to unattach myself from the violinist, that doesn't mean that it's morally permissible for me to do so. So if we're focusing on the moral question, this analogy won't help anyone out at all. 
most pro-choice advocates agree that continuing to let the person exist is better than abortion, is better than, sorry, cutting them off. So Thompson says, you don't have to, you know, you don't have an obligation to let the violinist stay there using your body, but it would be nice to, it would be better for you to do so. Um, if we think the analogy really works, then the an analogy with abortion is that it's better um, not to have an abortion, even though it's not an obligation you have. Uh, and often I think pro-choice activists don't even recognize this. They will say that abortion is completely morally neutral, even though the fetus is a human being. Um, and if we take Thompson's argument seriously, and even if Thompson's argument is true, that is inconsistent. Um, the argument basically justifies killing anyone who receives any kind of support from other people in order to survive. So most homeless people, for example, would die if we didn't give them charity, if we didn't give them shelters or food, and so on. There are so many people around the world and in our own country who rely on benefits. Um, but if Thompson's argument is correct, then it's morally permissible for us to just refuse to help them at all. Um, it's morally permissible for us to kill them just because they're using our resources in order to survive. Uh, I think this is obviously morally abhorrent. Obviously, we can't kill poor people just because they use our resources. Uh, and similarly, I think it's obviously immoral to kill an unborn person just because they're using our resources. Um, the argument doesn't justify abortion past the age of viability. So, uh, as was mentioned earlier, this age is now around 20 weeks that babies are surviving uh, at birth. Um, it's not a very high percentage at 20 weeks, but some 20-week-old fetuses will survive once taken out of the womb. Um, now, apply this analogy again with the, the violinist case. Suppose Thompson said, okay, you have a violinist next to you, and if you, uh, if you unhook her, she'll probably live. There's a fair chance she'll live if she's given the medical care. Um, Thompson's argument seems to be, if she's arguing for the permissibility of killing any fetus after 20 weeks, Thompson's argument would seem to commit her to saying, it's okay to kill this violinist. So in the case of abortion, we have, or at least in the case of post-20-week abortions, we have a fetus who is very possibly able to survive outside of the womb. And nevertheless, abortion activists say it should be okay to kill that fetus rather than just taking it out of the womb and trying to support it with um, artificial, artificial support. And so that seems an obvious problem for Thompson's case. And there are, some, there are many more problems with it. Um, the relationship is a parent-child one, so even though the violinist is a stranger, I might not have any obligations to her. If the violinist was my own son or daughter, I probably would. And the same is true with abortion. It's not just a case of a stranger. Uh, it's a parent-child relationship. Again, there's a difference between killing and letting die. Um, unhooking the violinist arguably counts as just letting die. Um, but in abortion, we don't do that. We don't just let the fetus die. In abortion, the fetus is actively killed. Um, and so again, I think that's another problem with Thompson's argument. And so another good reason to think that if the fetus is a human being, we really do have an obligation not to kill it. So just finally, in conclusion, um, lots of pro-choice critical thought can support the pro-life case, and I gave a few examples of this er earlier. Philosophy as a tool which is used for really detailed, analytic, rigorous thinking is a friend of the pro-life position rather than an enemy, because if the pro-life position is the correct one, and if philosophy aims to get at the truth, then philosophy will help us and be sympathetic to the pro-life position. The pro-life case explains many of our intuitions about humans, about rights, and about killing much better than the alternatives. And the alternative accounts fail very badly in accounting for our intuitions. And so, in conclusion, I think the balance of rights is on the unborn side, and very heavily on the unborn side. So thank you for listening.